Hi, I'm John Moolers and welcome to another in my videos about my time at the Department of Finance in Canberra in the early 19, I'm up, up to the early 1980s now and the bullying and harassment and just mental torture that happened during that time. Now I touched on this in, in the last video that, that my condition became worse and worse when I was there at at Department of Finance and it was one of the failings of the bosses there at the Department of Finance that they didn't pick this up in fact maybe they did pick it up but they did absolutely nothing about it there was no staff counsellor there there was no sort of mental health facilities or anything and no, there wasn't even a nurse there in the Department of Finance it, it was um, you know like I said it was still very much the law of the jungle there and um, the security guards had come in and had, and had changed the whole working environment there and and um, and I had moved into um, the reproduction room the print the print room they were just calling it the print room by this stage a job which I didn't like I didn't want to be there and I started just disliking it more and more I mean, I told you in the last video, I, I came back from the holiday in, in February um, 1983, uh, expecting a fresh start because um, the, the complaints against me had started up, that, that I had been called into the director's office several times, having to explain myself, having to write out reports for my file to, to try and rebut this. I was always being ignored. The complaints, the complaints were always upheld, and and everything like that. Um, the election of the Hawke government, um, I thought that you know things things would ease off a bit. That um, with the Labor government in office, that because the Whitlam government was very pro public service, um, they gave all these perks to the public service and everything, and and all that, I thought that maybe the pressure would would ease off a bit. But no, it became worse. Because all this desire for change had started up in the, the department and in the, the country generally. And within the department, um, one of the changes that they were agitating for was to get rid of me. I mean, that was when the desire to actually force me out of the department had started in the department. I mean, it started off fairly rudimentary, but then it intensified more and more. Um, and I think it w was um, April, May, probably about May or June 1983, um, there was a director there, Tony Preston Stanley, who I generally got along fairly well with, you know, I thought I'd gotten along fairly well with. But Jim Tuckerman, my supervisor, kept complaining to him about me. And other complaints had come in about me. And um, what happened, Jim Tuckerman, my supervisor in the print room, he was starting to drop hints that I was about to be sacked. You know, um, I, I remember hearing this and... and and I heard him say to somebody else, somebody else said to me, you know, what about Moolers? And Jim Tuck, uh, where's he going to be? Because they were talking about reorganisations and everything like that. And they said, where's Moolers going to be? And, and Jim Tuckerman said, on the rock and roll, meaning on the dole. You know, that was, that was how it was. And I, I decided to try and nip this garbage in the bud once and for all. I wrote out a report. I mean, um, we had a typewriter in the um, in the photocopy room because occasionally, um, you know, in most offices there was an electric typewriter there. It was before um, computers, before desktop computers, and and anything like that. And you had to write correspondence with an electric typewriter. So um, I got sat down on the electric typewriter and. The rule was that if you were typing out job applications or official correspondence, you were allowed to use the department's time to do that. 
And so I was there at the, the electric typewriter writing out this report, complaining about Jim Tuckerman, dropping hints all the time that I was about to be sacked. And I said that I can't work under these conditions. It's made work conditions for me uncomfortable and putting undue pressure on me. And could you please ask Jim Tuckerman to stop these hints? So anyway, I put that report into um, the director there, Preston Stanley, and it was successful. I mean, the, the, the hints stopped and everything, and Ron Axelby called me in and said, you know, you were so lucky you wrote that that minute, because, you know, they were about to send you to um, the Public Service Board to see if you could be redeployed in another department. Because back then you still had the Public Service Board. I mean, the Public Service Board was abolished later that year and, and Department of Finance took over its functions. So anyway, I had a bit of a reprieve. Um, I went back into the photocopy room and for the rest of 1983, it was, a, it was a really bad year because that was the year the drought broke. And it was raining all the time and it was just a really dark, bleak atmosphere all round, and, and, and it, it was a terrible year, and then there were political scandals, the Coom Evenov affair, and all that sort of thing was happening, and, um, but most significant, at the end of 1983 came the event which proved to be the killer, which was really the beginning of the end, that was when all the garbage really started. Um, Mr. Bennett, who was, was the Assistant Secretary of Management Services, he retired and they went and put this fella in there named John Galloway, J.V. Galloway. Now, I had become a problem in the department. I mean, I had a, my reputation within the department was rock bottom and everything. And um, like I said in the last video, there was lingering resentment over the fact that I hadn't had my appointment annulled in 1978, that I was confirmed in the job and that I was a, a, a constant annoyance within the department. But um, what had happened, this fellow, John Galloway, came into, um, into the position and he was a real hard liner. He, originally, he came from the General Expenditure Division and um, he was put there in as Assistant Secretary, Management Services Branch. And, um, and things really stepped up a notch when he came in. Um, Christmas 1983 came and then 1984 started. And this was George Orwell's 1984, Big Brother is Watching You and everything else. And for me, that book proved to be a self-fulfilling prophecy because that's exactly what it was like for me during that year. I mean, it was one of the worst years of my life. It was absolutely terrible. It was just, that was when my, my, my mental illness, my problems... All of all of this, and I, and I believe that that mental illness was created by the public service, the treatment that I was getting in the public service. Because you can't keep on going back there day after day, having all of this shit being thrown at you and, and, and it having no effect. I mean, it just doesn't happen like that. I think things just don't happen. You don't have complaints and shit being thrown at you day after day and then and then front up the next day as if nothing had happened you know I, I i can't i couldn't put up with that i mean i thought it was having no effect on me but i could sense that 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 things were getting worse and that that you know my condition was was getting worse and worse by caused by the treatment i was receiving there at department of finance and galloway he wasn't subtle at all. I mean, he was there encouraging people in the department to put in complaints against me. And Galloway, unlike the others, had a real trigger figure, trigger finger. I mean, he would reach for section, well, it was section 62 of the Public Service Act by this stage. They rewrote the Public Service Act and the, the provisions for 
disgraceful and improper conduct had been moved from section 55 to section 62. And I think during um, that year of 1984, I was charged under the Public Service Act twice, and he tried to charge me a third time under the Public Service Act. In fact, um, he wrote out charges, draft charges, to me and gave them to me. And look, by this stage, mid-1984, I was in an absolute malaise. I was, my head was spinning because of this day after day, this, this harassment, this bullying all the time. And, you know, people coming to the counter and, and complaining about nothing, literally nothing. You know, they would give me my photocopying over the counter. I would do the photocopying for them, hand it back to them, and I'd see this look in their eye and they'd go away and put in a complaint that I was rude and uncooperative. And I would say to um, Galloway and, and Walsh, I mean, the director by this stage was a fellow named John Walsh, and the rest of them, I'd say, look, nothing happened. I didn't do anything wrong. But of course, they upheld the complaint because every time someone put in a complaint against me, Jim Tuckerman, my supervisor, would chime in and say, oh, yes, he did that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and never once was a complaint resolved in my favour, no matter how much in the right I was. And it was the most frustrating thing. And I, I knew by this stage what was going on, that Galloway had one intention and one intention only, and that was to make work for me, the working conditions and life for me in the Department of Finance, so unbearable, so uncomfortable, so intolerable that I would be forced to resign. I mean, that was the strategy from the start. And I didn't know at the time, but Galloway got that job simply because he had a plan to get me out of the Department of Finance. And that the, the, the candidates for the Assistant Secretary job were asked at, at the interviews that they went to what they what their plans were for dealing with me, you know. I mean, oh, that was one of the questions in the interview, and and the others all all came up with you know, you know oh you know we'll we'll discipline him, we'll use section sixty two and all this sort of thing. But Galloway had a predetermined plan set out for getting me out of the department, and and uh, and. I'll tell you about that for not when it comes up to 1985. But, like I said, I mean, Galloway tried to have me charged a third time under Section, section 62 of the Public Service Act. But this time, for some reason, they got the Deputy Crown Solicitor involved. I mean, they later became the Australian Government Solicitor. And the Deputy Crown Solicitor threw it out. I mean, Galloway said what had happened. Oh, there was some alleged thing to do with, with perceived homosexuality or something that, that one of them had thought I'd made a pass or something like that. And the Deputy Crown Solicitor said, no, charges cannot go ahead. There are no grounds for charging him under Section 62. And it said in the letter, it said, in our opinion, this represents a management problem rather than a personnel problem. And now in the public service, that was a huge slap in the face. That was um, about as damning as you could get. But I didn't know it at the time. I, I didn't know that the Deputy Crown Solicitor had sent this letter to Galloway vetoing the charges. And, um, and things had really stepped up after that. I mean, Galloway had this huge slap in the face. So he thought that he had to step things up a gear. And, and it became a, 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 this pressure on me, like I said. I mean, I reacted against it. You know, I, I could see what was happening. You know, that the, the plan was to force me out of the Department of Finance. That, that they, the bosses there and everybody at finance thought that I shouldn't be there. That I had beaten the rap back in 1978. And that, that 
that I was I had stayed on in the Department of Finance due to a bureaucratic bungle, and that 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 if procedure had been followed and my probationary report was submitted on time, I would have been annulled from the Department of Finance and and Galloway and the, the, the rest of them had it as their intention to right the wrong, to, to get me out of the Department of Finance. And just this constant harassment and bullying all the time and and and, and at that this stage they brought in this new photocopier into the print room, a Rank Xerox 7400, which made this really loud noise all the time, just this, this constant noise. And it was kept on all the time. You know, as soon as they turned on the button at the start of business, this noise would start up and it, it just stayed, that noise, loud noise, all day, the whole working day. And I was expected to work with this. Oh, look, you know, by, you know, by the end of 1984, you know, I had sunk into a deep depression again. I mean, and by that stage, I was locked into the job because I was paying off alone now and I couldn't leave the job. And at the end of 1984, I took out another loan with the, the credit union for another holiday in Noosa and Surface Paradise. And, you know, I thought those holidays would, were, would do me good. But in effect, they, they only did harm to me because I had to come back from those holidays into that same toxic environment at the Department of Finance. You know, um, nothing had changed. In fact, things were getting worse and I knew that they were getting worse. And I'd come back into the job and I'd be thinking about what I was doing at Noosa. And, and surface paradise. And that year I went to Bribey Island as well and thinking about these tropical paradises in Queensland and having to come back to the public service in Canberra and do this rotten job, pressing a button on a photocopy machine all day, having to deal with bastards over the counter, running off to bosses, submitting complaints all the time. You know, and... and you know, and I thought that, that this condition that was just confined to me as well, but I saw a few weeks ago uh, a few news reports that it is a recognised medical and psychological condition coming back from work and not being able to adjust back into work and wishing you were still on holidays. I mean, it is a form of depression. I mean, it had some fancy name to it. I forget what the name of it was but it is a recognised physiological and psychological condition. And so when I saw that report, I, I felt, well, you know, perhaps it isn't as, as uncommon as I thought. Perhaps it isn't just me going through this, you know, having to come back to Canberra into that rotten work environment after I'd been up in Queensland. It was a case of, you know, how are we going to keep them down on the farm when they've seen the when they've seen Gay Paris. That was, that was what it was like. And I had to come back in 1985 um, into that work environment again. But this holiday was different. I mean, um, this time was a real eye-opener. This time I almost didn't come back at all. Um, this time I was on holidays and it was an extended holiday. I kept on extending it all the time. But I had the loans out at the, the credit union. I had to repay the loans from the credit union. So I was locked into that job. I had to stay into that in that job until the loans were paid off. And the loans weren't going to be paid off for a very long time. So I had no alternative, uh, you know. For the first time, I was actually locked into the job and I couldn't resign. I couldn't get out. And, you know, that only made the sensation of me being locked in a prison in a concentration camp even more pronounced, you know. But anyway, I'll go into that in more detail in the next video. And the next video is going to be a real doozy. Stick around for that. You won't believe your ears. Anyway, this is about to end. So thanks for listening and goodbye.